Yesterday in my budget presentation, I went through the recent history, economic history of Jamaica, uh, essentially trying to put in the, an accurate context where we are and where we're coming from. So I identified the many areas where the work that was done under the previous PNP administration, um, which was important work to turn the economy around and put our economy on a path towards sustainable debt reduction, was bearing fruit. And many of the projects that we had initiated and negotiated and brought to the table as part of our overall vision for bringing Jamaica into the center of the global supply chain for goods and services as a value-adding hub. Those projects um, were coming to fruition now. And so that what we have seen is the benefits of the continuity of sound policies and programs which were initiated mm -hmm. under our watch. Having said that, I also expressed some concerns in relation to the relatively low levels of real GDP growth which Jamaica has been experiencing over the last two years since the JLP came to office. In both of their, those years, they have not been able to meet their own budgeted growth targets. And the Economic Growth Council, which they set up, which had this ambitious five in four projection to achieve growth of 5% per annum in four years. Unfortunately, it seems very clear that that is no longer a target that they consider achievable. If you look at the government's own targets in the fiscal policy paper that they published when and the minister signed and tabled in Parliament on the 15th of February, I think it was, you will see that they are projecting much lower levels of growth um, over the medium term. And we are concerned about this because we feel that the Jamaican economy, having been stabilized, having been restructured and reoriented towards competitiveness and on a solid fiscal footing with our national debt coming down significantly, we ought to be seeing higher levels of growth. Just by way of comparison, world economic growth for 2017 was over 3%. Growth in the United States of America and in the Eurozone, which are mature economies, and mature economies aren't expected to grow at the rate of a successful emerging economies. In those two economies, US and Eurozone, they grew at 2.5% real GDP growth in 2017. Jamaica only managed 0.5% real GDP growth in 2017. And in fact, for the first half of the year, the economy didn't grow at all. And in the second quarter of the year, we had negative real GDP growth for the first time after nine consecutive quarters of positive GDP growth, which began under our administration in January 2015. And I highlighted in my presentation that I don't think that the government's growth strategy is well calibrated. I think it lacks balance. So they have established an economic growth council, largely comprised of very wealthy and successful businessmen. But they don't have a broad vision of national development that would include in the strategizing and implementation of policies to achieve growth, a broad cross-section of the stakeholders in our society. We would like to see, for example, small business, farmers, the public sector, the trade unions, the churches, the, entertainment, in the entertainers, all of these segments of society included in the attempt to achieve high levels of growth because we see inclusive growth as very, very important in order to achieve a society that is well balanced with social cohesion where there aren't vast inequalities and so on. If we proceed along the path that we are on now, if we do achieve growth, what we will see is the richer getting richer, rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, and a lot of the additional wealth that is created will accrue only to those who hold capital and mainly foreigners. 
and we want to see a Jamaica where the ordinary people of our country benefit from the growth in the economy. This is part of the PNP's vision of national development, which goes back to 1938 as a national movement. So these are some of the things I was discussing. In terms of some of the things that we are working on as priorities for when we next form government, I mentioned four areas. Firstly, land reform and land titling reform. In Jamaica, we have significant portions of land, over 700,000 plots of land which are not registered with titles. And this has been a source of persistent poverty over generations because without titling those lands, farmers can't access credit to expand their farms. And rural development as a whole is stymied. So we see this as a complex and structural problem which many attempts have been made in the past to deal with but have not achieved the desired result. And we intend to achieve that when we next form government through some radical, far-reaching legislative and administrative reforms. And the party leader, I believe, may speak to this in greater detail tomorrow in Parliament. We also consider early childhood education and indeed the nurturing of the, our young children from the ages of zero to eight as critical to national development. If we start our children right, a lot of the problems that we see emerging as they become adolescents and become alienated because they haven't had the benefits of a, of a well-nurtured childhood, becoming those things lead to all sorts of social problems. It feeds crime and violence and so on. So we believe that much greater emphasis needs to be placed in this, on this area. We have an ad hoc system of early childhood education presently. Attempts have been made to bring it and, um, to up to certain standards, but a lot more needs to be done. And we need to see it not just focusing on purely academics, though we believe it's very important that we achieve out outcomes of literacy and numeracy um, and uh, at at least a basic level by age eight, but also nutrition and thing and social values. Uh, these things are are important for the developing of good citizens. So we think a rounded approach that ensures that our children get all the inputs that they need to become good citizens is critical. We also think that the whole problem that we have with these so-called unattached youth, youth who are out of school not in a job, not in any kind of training, just on the corner and vulnerable and often alienated by society. We need a national program that will really address their needs and address them in a holistic way because there are many aspects to this, mentoring, training, remedial education, building their self-esteem and so on. But there's also a realistic aspect of it. These, they need to be exposed to the, what it means to have a job and to keep them in a program, they need to receive some form of remuneration because everybody needs to live. So this is another area which we want to pay particular attention to. And the last area that I mentioned was that of tertiary education and the financing of tertiary education. Too many of our children from financially challenged backgrounds struggle through tertiary education. Many of them don't make to end to complete their degrees because the existing arrangements are not satisfactory, are not adequate. And we think that time has come for that to be addressed because everyone knows that the way to achieve so social mobility in Jamaica and anywhere in the world is through education. And we are the party that believes and has always believed in, edu in education. This is an area which we will be paying great attention to. I also mentioned some of the issues of concern in relation to the public sector um, wage bill negotiations and the way the government is handling that and where it has reached the point where the teachers have been out on sick, um, sick, uh, sick out and at a time which is obviously crucial for children who have exams coming up, GSAT and so on, and the, the, the government's arrogance really in determining to pay retroactive amounts to categories of workers who are still consider themselves to be at the negotiating table, even if the government is not willing to negotiate with them. But no agreements have been concluded with those categories. And to be making payments to them on the basis 
of a one-sided determination of what they should be paid is not only arrogant, but is of questionable legality and is in certainly in violation of the in, uh, International Labour Organization Convention that supports collective bargaining and indeed the Labour Relations Code of Jamaica, which was approved by Parliament back, I believe, in 1976 and still remains to this day the guiding um, rubric for labour relations that the Industrial Disputes Tribunal follows. These are some of the things that I spoke to yesterday, and I will now um, open the floor for questioning. Just identify yourself and the media house that you're from. Well, clearly, <coughs> the point I was making was when you announced this program back in February 2016, when the government did this, that they sold it on the basis that it wouldn't cost any additional taxes, that they had found a way to miraculously fund this through existing resources, and that it would only cost just over $12 billion. After they came into office on the basis of this plan that they had announced, which ever led people to believe that they would be getting $18,000 a month of additional income in their pockets under the so-called 1.5 plan, they the government changed its tune. All of a sudden, it said they, they had a philosophy of moving from direct to indirect taxation, and that, in fact, it was only going to cost over $30 billion of additional taxation to give this tax break to those who are already earning over $600,000 a year in formal employment. And that 30 billion of additional, over 30 billion of additional taxation has been imposed through indirect taxes on everything basically that people consume. Either, whether they, they buy it in the form, and it's paid in the form of GCT or SCT on their direct purchase, or they're using services which include costs which have indirect taxes in them, such as transportation services and electricity. In terms of what we would be doing when we come to office, essentially we are committed to the, maintaining the course of debt reduction, and that requires generating fiscal surpluses that will allow the debt to be continually paid down. We will be looking at the overall structure of that program to see the, the glide path that we think is appropriate, given where Jamaica is now. And we would look, be looking to create the necessary fiscal space to ensure that the less fortunate are adequately looked after, whether it be through um, a, a close study of how the PATH program works, but more importantly, those programs that I already mentioned, for example, how you deal with unattached youths, which are a large cohort within the vulnerable in the society who are feeling the effects of that 30 billion of additional indirect taxation and creating training and then employment opportunities targeted at them. So these are some of the things that we'll be looking at um, as being important to try and rebalance the society towards one which is more socially cohesive. I mean, as a result of the imbalances in our society, we have a murder rate which has gone up since this government took office by over 300 murders per year relative to the average that we had it when we were in office. This is a serious problem. We've had to have a state of emergency declared in our tourist capital right at the heart of the winter of tourist season. This is unheard of. I mean, how is that complementary to growth? You see, the, the problems that are manifesting themselves in an extreme form as a result of the imbalances in our society are, are reflect the fact that we are not really tackling the root problems that we have. And a PNP government is certainly going to be more oriented towards achieving that. I'm not saying that the solutions are easy. They are not. And they may take time to work. But at least we need to get on the right pathway towards tackling those problems. Any other questions? No? We're all good? Greetings. Based on your analysis of the numbers and your knowledge of the 
fiscal situation. Um, do you see room for additional monies, uh, a significantly better offer to be made um, for public sector workers? And I suppose the basic question is, um, if yes, um, where should the money come from? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I th the answer is yes, I think it is possible. Um, because of the tax reforms that we implemented to tax administration, and I listed them in my presentation, they're varied and attacking different aspects of tax reform, from the introduction of the revenue information um, system, a technology platform with the acronym RAISE, which has really transformed the efficiency of administration of tax to better to laws which have created greater powers of collection and enforcement, third party information, garnishing of third party debts owing to delinquent taxpayers, uh, the customs reform through the Asikuda system that will, has been introduced, and the establishment of ta Tax Administration Jamaica, TAJ, as a semi autonomous revenue agency. All of these things have borne fruit, and we've seen, despite the anemic growth in the economy, we have seen significant improvements in tax collection. And in fact, the government is projecting for this coming fiscal year a further 40 billion of additional tax collections, notwithstanding the fact that this year they've overshot the tax collection targets as well. And I think that it's a question of prioritizing. We, the government has chosen this year to go very heavily towards certain types of capital expenditure. And that is largely road projects and the NIDS, the rollout of the NIDS program. Those things are, are uh, billions of dollars are being spent on that. And also, they're spending over six billion of additional dollars on helicopters and vehicles for the military. This, re this, this reflects all of these, cho these are all choices as to how you allocate the, the limited resources that we have. And I think that if you want to have a public service that can support a growing economy. It has to be one that is motivated, one which can attract talent and maintain talent. The private sector can't function without an efficient public sector because all of the services that they require, regulatory and otherwise, in order to trade and do business, are supported by the public sector. So it's vital that we have a well-motivated and well-staffed, trained and skilled public sector. So I think that is a priority. Now, in terms of which one of the programs and how you would rejuggle the resources, I'm not, it's not really my decision, and I'm not here to tell you exactly how we would do it, because I think that is a thing that you have to look at carefully, and you have to take into account your technical advice and so on. But it's really all driven by the prioritization of where you are. I think the government is so upset about the lack of growth in the economy, despite all of they've said about being the, the star boys of growth, essentially, and having this massive monolithic ministry of economic growth and job creation, which is the ministry of everything and nothing. They, need, they want to go as hard as they can by pushing capital expenditure. If you look at the public body's budget, you will see that virtually every public body is being squeezed out of cash into, into capital expenditure. I think uh, nearly 18 billion of additional capital expenditure coming out of the public bodies on top of the, the central government budget's increase in capital expenditure. So that is what they have chosen to focus on. As I've said already, I think that without a balanced society, you're not going to get growth, even if you spend all that money on capital projects. It's better to set the social environment first so that we have a cohesive society where hope is restored, fear is eliminated, and we can move forward. Jamaica has so much to offer investors in tourism, in all sorts of value-added services around business processes outsourcing, in the logistics area, et cetera, et cetera. We, it's not the economics which we need to get right at this time. It's the social dimension. And part of that is having the public sector motivated and adequately staffed with the technical skills it needs. So I think that needs to be prioritized. And the offer that they put on the table, Abka, of 16% over four years is below the inflation rate that they're projecting for that period. So essentially they're telling the public sector workers, just become poorer, stay, in, stay the course and become poorer. That can't be an offer to attract the kind of talent you need to the public sector. So we think that there is room. We know that we're aware of this 9% target that's there, 
And as far as I am concerned, that is something which is a somewhat arbitrary target that I think the IMF would accept, that there's no magic to that number. That is something which could be adjusted through negotiation, and it's in the law, but we could amend it if necessary. It should not be the basis of ramming down the throats of the public sector workers an unfair settlement, and a settlement which essentially impoverishes them further over the medium term, and which is inimical to the interests of the country, which needs a well-motivated and well-skilled public sector to deliver services that are needed by the business community and investors to become, for Jamaica to become internationally competitive. Well, we will reconcile your assessment of the current offer with the offer made in 2015, which was basically an average of this for two and a half percent Different per circumstances. Mm. I, I envisage uh, your criticism of the current offer in general the public domain and folks asking how you reconcile that criticism with what was offered in 2015, and I also suppose you would argue that the fundamentals of the economy have changed. Yeah. That well, it's a good question. It's a fair question. I would argue two things. First of all, the way in which we designed our offer was that it wasn't the same for everybody. With the person at the lower end of the scale were treated more favorably than those at the upper end of the scale because it was appreciated that a 5%, say, of somebody who's earning 8000 um, a week is a $400. And the bottom, end of, the bottom end of the public sector workers in our offer back in 2015, the minimum they got was $1,000 a week. Now, with the way that this government has structured their offer, there will be many people who are getting less, an increase which is significantly less than that. So that's one point. The other point I would make, so just to finish that point, is that we had a more nuanced approach based on dialogue and consultation and respect for them and came up with a an arrangement which they were prepared to accept. We didn't force them to accept it. We negotiated with them in good faith, and we stayed the course with that negotiation, and we got them to agree it in the national interest. That has not happened this time around. Secondly, I would argue strongly that the economic circumstances have changed. When we were back in 2015, we were still in a situation where we were two years into the economic reform program, where the fruits of the work they were doing were just starting, but had not yet really start borne fruit in the way they have now. So in terms of the buoyancy of revenues, we didn't have that to play with then. So it's a very different set of circumstances. Minister Shaw was saying that he has run primary surpluses in excess of 7% of GDP, which is the target. He's underspent because the revenues have been so buoyant and they can't really roll out the, the capital expenditure at the pace that allows them to spend um, at, the, at the pace at which the money is coming in. So the situation is very different now and it's, and it's going to continue because, as I've said, they are projecting for 1819, the common fiscal year, $40 billion of additional tax revenue when tax revenues are already substantially up this year and the year before. So it is a different situation, Abka. It's very different. And I think that they could have, I, I just feel that they are a bit paranoid about it because they know that we hit every single IMF benchmark and target on time. And I think they don't be the want to be the ones that stray and, and fail to hit a target. And I think that is probably why they haven't addressed this issue in a way I think we would have addressed it. Um, because it's really, what they're trying to do is ram a square peg through a round hole, and it just can't work. Did you by chance hear the finance minister this week on saying there will be something fundamentally flawed concerning how, just how much the economy has grown is measured? Yes. What's the I, I heard it. I heard him say that. There's nothing new in that, Abka. From Omar Davis' time, um, it was m many commentators on both in the public sector and elsewhere, felt that our economy is undermeasured. And that may well be true. The extent of the undermeasurement is not known. The number which I think the IDB put that 40% of our economy is, is informal and not measured. That was a long time ago. That was um, in the 1990s, I think, that the research was done that, that led to that. There's no current data, as far as I know, on the size of that. But the truth is that you have to work with what you have until you improve it. And statin, just as a case in point, has two technical staff, I am told, two 
collating the, the statistics around the size of our economy. And there's no budget for increasing that. So if Mr. Shaw is concerned about the undermeasurement of the economy, why doesn't he give statin a budget that can staff it adequately to do the work it needs to do? That's part of his ministry. So all I'm saying is what the situation that he faces around the measurement of the economy sure. is the same that we faced and, uh, and Bruce Golding governments faced and governments before them faced. There is a, a, a technical way of, of, of doing it, and it's, it's not, I, I, as far as I'm aware, it's not any different to what is generally accepted across the world. There, it may be that there could be, there could be um, refinements to it. I wouldn't doubt it. And, but I don't think that it's, to me, it is a refuge of a, fail, a failed attempt at growth when you start to blame the statistics and say that's the reason why we're not growing is because the statistics aren't correct. There are his statistics.